Elliot Randall tells us what it was like working with Yoko Ono after John Lennon passed away. This is Rocky Stream Music. Remember, if you want to support the channel, there are links in the description. You can either buy a t-shirt, make a donation on PayPal, or join our Patreon. Here's Elliot Randall. John Lennon was... So that was Milk and Honey. That, that would have been, of course, the Donald, the double fantasy sessions, like with Jack Douglas, where you, was that when... when, uh, when Okay, I got called in not that long after John was killed. So this was whatever the name of that, of that album was, and the one after that, Yoko produced, put together a really wonderful band, and um, makes her entrance. She comes in, we're all sitting there, tuned up, ready to go, and she says, good morning, ladies, all of us being men. And she totally broke the thin ice. It was just like we wanted to do everything we could to make her experience really great. Okay, if she wasn't Yoko Ono, she was just your interaction with her, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions about her. I know a lot of people, you know, they hate her music, they hate her voice, they, 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 mm -hmm. you know, she's an easy, they, they go after her. But, but as just you meet this lady... What would your impressions be? And I'm not asking for dirt. I'm just going curious. So what, what, how would you describe this woman? She was a one, is a wonderful avant-garde artist. Whether or not one likes her singing, it's, it almost doesn't make any difference to me because it's, it's about what she's trying to do, what she's trying to portray. And, of course, she's an artist with a conscience. You know, you recall those, you know, stop the war things. That was real. She's for real. So she, she gets a thousand percent of my respect. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize, and pardon my ignorance, I didn't realize that was after John had been assassinated that you, you went in. Just that in itself must have been in. I mean, what was your first thought going into that? You're going, well, wait. Well, my mind was pretty blown. You know, I mean, obviously, I, I love John. And, um, I'd never recorded with him. A bunch of my friends did, you know, McCracken and Spinoza and those guys. Um, but here I was having a chance to make a little bit of a state statement. And some of the stuff we played on was, you know, tracks that John had already recorded, which I think came out on this, on the album after the, the, the first one that we did with her. Mm -hmm. um, but man, what an experience. Well, there's that thing about I've, I've looked, you know, you, you have a few years on me probably, but I'm, I'm 62 and at my age, I'm working harder, but, but with less stress than I ever have because of just learning, you know, hard fought lessons. But I, uh, Elliot, I'll look at some paths that I could have taken. Like I almost I got a job in San Diego for as a evening new age NAC format guy. Mm -hmm. And I remember I didn't take it because I didn't have a green card, but there was a, I, I sometimes look at a thing like that and say, if I would have done that, and I know you said this about the Blues Brothers, yeah. I'd be probably dead now. I'd probably be dead. Do you have a lot? I mean, uh, um, turning down these things, the first lesson is always what, are, yeah, you're, you've said this before. Are you, are you crazy? But again, going back to that, that, that going, if I put myself in that room, bad things might happen to me or else I'll be uncomfortable or my quality of life won't be there. Mm. Yeah. I, I generally think it through a little bit more quickly. It's, it's, um, am I going to be happy? Do I look like, do I think I'm going to be happy in two or five years time? And if the answer is Maybe, maybe not. I have to really give it a little bit of extra thought. Mm -hmm. uh, when somebody calls me for the studio, nine out of ten times, I'll say yes. Because generally, I'll know who they are. I'll know what their quality of work is. And I'll come in. Um, if it's to play live, that's a whole other story. Playing live, by the way, is the other half of the equation of the things that make me really, really happy. But I love entertaining. I love going out and getting that visceral feeling when you're connecting with an audience. There's, there's nothing like it. I, I can't describe it in any kind of words that would do it justice. So you're not shy. Oh. You're not shy. That's the no, thing. not at all. Everyone not would probably all. think you're shy. Sorry. I interrupted you there. You were going no, to that's all right. Um, I had a, my second guitar teacher was Roy Smeck. I don't know if you know the name. He was, he was born in 1900. 
he was called the Wizard of the Strings. And even though, and I love Les Paul, even though Les Paul is credited with having done the first multi-tracks, Roy actually did one as a short film. They divided the screen into four parts. And on one part, he's playing banjo, another part, he's playing uke, another part, he's playing lap steel, <laughs> another, he's playing legitimate guitar. And he was such a force. He was a very loving guy. He loved his music. He loved his students. He taught like probably five, maybe six days a week, you know, all day long. And he, he imparted these incredible life lessons with me. Um, the most important one being, kid, you got to smile more. You got to make them think you're having a good time. And then you got to have a good time. And it stuck. It absolutely stuck. Like, what else did he tell you? I mean, that, that, that's, uh, there are people that we meet in our lives and all of a sudden it's like you, you, we, we all cherry pick with it, advice, of course, but at the mm -hmm. same time, there are people you, you, you uh, do less cherry picking and you just have a certain trust with what they say. That's right. That's right. Uh, and with Roy, I mean, given that I, I started studying with him when I was like 12 years old. Yeah. So he got me as a, as a young, hot up and comer or an up and comer who thought he was hot. And Roy entertained all of my dreams, but he also made it very clear that I had a real job to do in terms of learning the instrument, learning how the instrument gets along with other instruments, uh, and being a part of an ensemble. And I, I, know that I noticed that you had a, a little chat with Jeff about ego on one of your interviews. And my take on ego has been for a very, very long time. Of course, I've got an ego. Everybody has an ego. Uh, but what do you do with it? You know, how, how, do you, how do you figure out ways to filter what needs to go into being a good person? And in terms of ego as a musician, I think that the supreme ego is to say, okay, I'm here to do a job. I'm here to do the best I can for whoever it is who's asked me to come and play. And by going higher up than the, hey, it's me, I'm playing, it's the, hey, I'm servicing the piece of music. And that to me is, is that, you know, is what ego should be about or should be thought about. We'll have more from Elliot Randall in a couple of days. Remember, he was a session guitarist for Steely Dan, Frankie Valley. Paul Lanka, two of the KISS members' solo albums, Gene Simmons, Peter Chris. He worked with the Village People, Richie Havens, Peter Frampton, Yoko Ono, Carly Simon, Carl Wilson, Laura Nero, Kirsty McCall, and many others. Remember, if you want to support the channel, all the links are in the description. You can make a donation at PayPal, join our Patreon, or buy a t-shirt. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music.